Welcome to the NBA Coast to Coast podcast brought to you by thelines.com. Coming to you from the West Coast, Josh Lander, joined by Nate Weitzer. He's on the East Coast, and we are looking at playoff props here for Wednesday with just one playoff game to go through here as the Knicks and Pacers head to game two. We're going to be uh, also have a best bets video up for you alongside these player props in a separate episode. So make sure to subscribe to that page and continue to follow along. Also want you to head to the lines.com and use that prop finder tool that we have under the NBA tab. Make sure you're getting the best juice back on all of these bets that you're making this NBA season. Hey, let's get right into your first NBA player prop for tonight. Yeah, I'm going to go with a lean that I had for game one that I did not actually pull the trigger on, but I will circle back to it now. OG on under 16 and a half points. Uh, about minus 118 now. The juice is not as friendly, but I mean, he had 13 in game one and he had three triples at, and continues to shoot at an, at an outlier rate, 41% from deep in his last three here, uh, where he's like a 35% shooter on the season from deep. And, and Indy is a team that just limits three pointers completely uh, number one since the all-star break, six fewest makes to power forwards. And the percentage is fourth best on normal three pointers. That is within 24 feet since the all-star break. So really good three point defense, his threes, two of them, I believe came off broken plays off offensive rebounds where it was just like lucked out. Uh, And then he had two, two point field goals that were basically created off turnovers and only Boston uh, allowed fewer points off turnovers than these Indiana Pacers post all-star break. The Pacers who were running around uh, these tired Knicks and and basically controlling the game for most of that. So I just don't know what you're going to depend on for OG as far as scoring. Like he's, he's counted on to play huge minutes and I like his rebounds. Sure. Uh, I, I like, I like his defense and he probably does a better job on Siakam this game uh, after getting kind of cooked by his former teammate. But I, I've talked about him just not being that involved in this offense because it is so heliocentric with Brunson. And then DiVincenzo is so clearly the number two option and Josh Hart is an, I got this guy. Uh, and, and so OG is by far the fifth option here. Who's uh, uh, dealing with an elbow injury, already not a great three point shooter, a bit of an outlier uh, in terms of how many he's taken and made recently. And he's still only averaging 16.3 on 17% usage in these last three with, with that good three point shooting 41%. Um, the Pacers. Yeah. I mean, in the playoffs, since that game one loss, they've allowed just 6.7 three point attempts in the normal range and held opponents to 25%. So I, I, I think that all that sees says that like, this is, this was a bit of an outlier as far as how he scored. If he does score on these weird, like herky jerky mid range pull-ups, like tip of the cap, OG didn't really think he had that in your game at this point, but I, I don't think he's a very um, effective offensive player in this series right now. Yeah. The only thing that would possibly give me pause about OG is as I kind of mentioned in best bets, dude might be playing all the entirety of the game. That said, like the, that's only, that's only like four more minutes that he played last game. Um, plus you get the fact that like 14 shots, that's also a little bit of what scares me is like OG in the end of the last series started to, take a lot more two pointers, which it, it is not necessarily a better shot for him than like a catch and shoot three in the corner by any means. But it, it does mean that like, he's more willing to shoot from other places on the floor. He's more of a make uh, create your own shot player for them at this point, uh, especially with the matchups that he has, like when he has the, the, the matchup, he'll go for it. But um, look, I mean, he made three threes last game and he couldn't get there. So the math doesn't totally math because if he does not, if he's not a 40% shooter. So if he goes two for seven from three next game, it's even, it's, it's like, he now needs to go basically like what, like six for seven on his other, on his twos at that point. Like that's not something I want to bank on. So I couldn't get there with the math to go over for OG um, and didn't have the, the, the cojones necessarily to go under just because like I said, of the amount of time and the fact that it seems like he's, almost option number two as far as go get your own shot, or at least he seems to feel like he is because he's doing that in the last three games with the amount of shot attempts he's taking. But I don't know that this is going to be a situation you want to keep banking on him hitting that many threes is really the the final point. So I'm going to go under on Brunson threes, though, because I've just watched his three-point attempts dwindle down uh, consistently, especially against his Pacers squad. So under two and a half for him is minus 108 on Caesars for him to not make three. He took four last game. And if you looked at the one that he – like. Here's the thing that not many people are talking about, but as a Knicks fan, my my butt was puckered for uh, this this moment in time where it was like, there's about two and a half, three minutes left. Brunson's dribbling the ball at the top of the key with like five seconds on the shot clock, gets the ball back at about five seconds, pulls it, 
like right away in like a very quick release, like boom, like I need to shoot real right, right now. And it went, it touched nothing but net. But I was like, if that doesn't go in, we're down five and this game might be damn near over. So like that even felt like a little bit of an outlier that I don't want to have to rely on him making. And the, the threes aren't there, not just because they are actually, I mean, this is the, this is what the Pacers do. They're awful at defending the paint as we know, and they're really good at defending the three point line because they run you off that thing. Um, and they did that to him too. But also, like, he's, like, welcoming it. He's like, please run me off of this line so I can get into the foul line area. I will either get to the free throw line like I did 14 times last game, or I'm going to hit this little, you know, 12-footer that is just absolute cash when I pull it. I just think he's playing cerebrally in that sense and that he's going and getting to the spots that he wants to get to and taking a much higher percentage shot than the three, even when it's there. Um, so I'm just going to keep banking on him doing that, because if you look at his attempts uh, against this team, he shot eight in the first game of the season back in December. Every single game since then, it's dwindled down from six, five, four. Right and now we're at four threes in this last game. Um, and yeah, I just I mean, look, there might be situations where he's just like, I'm so tired. Me shoot now instead of drive. But I mean, if he's trying to win, then that's going to be few and far between that. He's just going to take that three because he's tired, for instance. Right. Like I heard that as an argument of like, well, how long can he keep running into the, you know, into dudes and getting to the basket? And I'm like, as often as it takes, because that's how his game plan is to win. So uh, I think they're going to keep taking the three away from him. If they, when they do mix up coverages a bit and, and throw more dudes at him on the three point line, it's only more reason to, to believe in him actually going into the, to the lane a bit more uh, or finding an open dude for an imbalanced offense at, or defense at that point and, you know, moving the ball around the, the perimeter. So I just don't think he'll be the dude on the end of those threes ever, uh, as he is the focal point of the, of the defense for, for, for Indy. Um, and that's going to be what, what that basically, yeah, just no, no attempts more than anything. Right. Yeah, yeah, they got to they got to focus in on this dude who scored 40 plus in four straight playoff games and now has a core prop of 37 and a half. Uh, I mean, it's insane. I, I don't know why we didn't think in game one, just like, let's take an alt over on Jalen Brunson, who shoots every dime down the floor in crunch time. If he can, if the other team doesn't double him, they should double him more. <clears throat> so they shouldn't uh, allow him to get those shots off. That's exactly the logic. Not. Yeah. Um, so TJ McConnell over 14 and a half points and assists is where I would go for the second point, uh, second pick here. I had a couple SGP options with McConnell to get 10 plus points for plus assists, but I think honestly, the conservative way is to, to combine them because he can do both extremely efficient per minute player. I mean, I talked about has the highest assist to pass ratio on the squad for the Pacers that he's like among the leaders in like potential and secondary assists and passes made playing half as many minutes as some of the dudes in the playoffs this year and, and all. And when he's faced the, the Knicks in the regular season in his last four, he has one assist per every three minutes played. So six assists per game playing just 18 minutes. He did have one without Halliburton uh, last April, which is skewing this a little bit, 18 and 12 in that spot. Uh, but even if you take that out, he's still getting one assist for every four minutes played. Um, and yeah, he has, 9.3 potential assists his last four in the playoffs, third most passes on the team, like I'm saying. And maybe he does play a little bit more because, as you mentioned, like his stats guarding Brunson were way better than Nemhard. And he was a more, much more effective offensive player. I mean, you don't want him necessarily with the starters because he's capitalizing so well on these Knicks starters being tired in like the second and en end of the third uh, when he can just blow by them. But Either way, he's had a lot of success against the Knicks defense at yeah, 14.3 points, seven assists. He's a plus 23 in these four matchups in the regular season, shot 65% from the floor and looked completely in control on his drives here in game one. It, again, a low, a low minute player, but a 30% usage rate in these 20 minutes per game in his last four. So I'm back in McConnell every way, which, which way here. Um, and I think the points and assists are clearly the most reliable for a guy who's just like the engine of a, of a great second unit. Yeah. Yeah. It makes total sense. Um, the, the interesting thing too, is like he was playing poorly at first against Milwaukee. I mean, Pat Bev was guarding him the whole time. That's, that's not a dude that it, that's not Jalen Brunson. So yeah, I I'm fine. If you want to add the assist, it's, it's, that's pretty high for the potentials for him all, all uh, playoff long. That makes sense to me. So I, I'm with that um, for, for McConnell. Like I, I love all his stuff. Yeah. Like I was, I was looking at that too, like, you know, so uh, no notes really on, on McConnell there. Um, and by the way, uh, Obi is the other dude where it's like, if you're a sharp better and you're a sharp stat guy and you're looking at like, oh, well, how can Obi keep doing this? Like, 
this is the Pacers in a nutshell is like, they're going to have dudes fresh off the bench that are less tired than the dudes they're playing against at this point in the playoffs. And that's part of, I guess, Rick Carlisle's nine man rotation in the playoffs, which is just unprecedented to be honest. Um, and could not be further from how Tibbs plays. And I think Carlisle is just playing into that and McConnell's is his secret weapon. So, um, I am going to take something that you pointed out because I just need to apologize to the city of New York, Josh Hart, Rebound leader. I tried to fade him last last game, and the points were my preferred fade. And I would still say, if you wanted to, leave, you know, leave points off of any Josh Hart overs, I think that's probably still okay. Uh, I don't want to have to bank on him hitting that many shots. And there could be something to the idea that Tibbs is like, "Stop running so much! Like we can't keep up this pace, and I'm playing you all." the whole game so you're not allowed to fast break unless i tell you um in which case that would that would also take away from his points because he does rely on that a ton but uh more importantly i mean this man is a freaking magnet to the ball when it's on the rim and now i mean mitch rob didn't really impact that first game right he played 11 minutes uh barely put up any numbers wasn't really much of an impact and He's might there. have already been yeah he many might, might have already been on that bum leg uh, i mean he was it was already injured in philly and then Whatever happened in that game, he couldn't make it back, et cetera. I don't love it. It's not a great loss by any means for the Knicks. But it, it does mean that, like, there's even fewer minutes that there's a, uh, a top-tier rebounder on the floor for Josh Hart, to uh, that leaving Josh Hart to get his, right? Like, 20 rebound chances in this last game, 20 rebound chances in pretty much every playoff game. I think there's two now that he had fewer than 20 rebound chances, and they were still at 18 and 19 rebound chances. So, like... Man, it's tough to uh, tough to see anybody. The other thing that I would add here that's like even more important than anything is like who on the Pacers is going to challenge him for this. Um, if you look at the rebound chances for the Pacers last game, Isaiah Jackson led the team in rebound chances in his like 16 minutes on the floor. 11 of them. Pascal, nine. Turner, nine to get two. Uh, Neesmith, eight. Uh, Halliburton, four. Um, and Nemhart four. Right. So that's like six dudes right there. The, the, the starters plus like the best rebounding uh, bench player nobody had more than 11 and Isaiah Jackson's 11 were in part because I honestly like he might be the biggest threat because the the shots are being missed by the Knicks more when the starters are off the floor for the Pacers when the Knicks are going up against the Pacers backups we've just been talking about this a lot they're tired and Obi Toppin's running right by them TJ McConnell's running right by them Isaiah Jackson is running right by them um, not full court but he is getting by them once he uh, is near the rim and he's getting inside of guys like uh, Mitch Rob when he was in there so that's really what this comes down to as much as anything is like the the who's going to out rebound him on the other team because I Hartenstein is going to be busy either pulled away from the basket by Miles Turner which is why I don't even mind I mean he's at I think nine and a half now and I still think that's a better under for Hartenstein's boards than it is for an over he had some really big rebounding games in the regular season against his Pacers team um, I don't think we're going to see 101 pace in this game or this series so I'll just keep that in mind about rebound chances and stuff like that um, but yeah Josh Hart is going to be the dude getting more boards than anybody on Indy to be honest that's where I'm at uh, I guess Pascal if he decides to like big boy OG but like I said nine rebound chances for Pascal he's all also an in and out type of player. And Josh Hart is the energizer bunny that is literally a magnet to the basketball, uh, whether it's on the ground or up in the air. So he's, uh, I'm, I'm not going to fade his rebounds anymore, even as it gets up to 12 and a half. I'm just going to let it go. And, and instead of taking the 12 and a half, I think this is a good way to play his, his boards as rebound leader. Yeah, I mean, it's been popular. It's moved from minus 120 to minus 160 because it is, yeah, because the Pacers are so balanced, right? That there's no real threat to be a double digit rebounder or score, which, you know, kind of points out the, the, the parlay, the leader parlay that FanDuel offers. Like you can't make these yourself, but they offer you a bunch. Mm -hmm. And I'll call it the Occam's razor parlay for plus plus one ninety, which is the most simple explanation, which is Jalen Brunson leads the game in points. Hart leads in rebounds. Halliburton leads in assist plus one ninety. It's like, it, it's hard to really imagine a scenario. Like anything else would be an outlier. Um, I mean, I guess the assist could go one way or another if Halliburton yeah. isn't keeping the defense honest enough to get his assists and Brunson could out assist him. And I mean, that is plus 350 if Brunson leads in both points and assists. But I mean, as far as him scoring, like that's reliable. Uh, and I, I, I like the idea that Tibbs is like, you're not allowed to run. Uh, like we're, we're not doing that, which, you know, reminds me of the, the four on four rule where you cannot pass it across half court if you're playing full court four on four which actually makes for a fun game uh, because, you know, four on four half court is is terrible and, and just absolutely clunky. And so if you're ever in a situation where you got eight guys and you got a full gym to run with, just just install that rule and you have to dribble it over half court and play some half court basketball. And uh, it's great. That's your little pickup, um, pickup announcement for today.
Yeah, that's from Coach Weitzer right there. I would also say something interesting that came out here. Um, Tyrese, you know, do what you will, but I do think, especially once you get in the playoffs, like ha- looking at these uh, post game interviews or, or, you know, when the media has uh, availability at, at shoot around stuff like that, Tyrese Halliburton did say, he's like, look, I was trying to play make a lot in this last game. Maybe that wasn't the right decision for me. I still got to be who I am, but I'll be better tomorrow. Um, so it, what he's saying to me is like, I'm still going to pass a lot, but apparently I need to shoot more. Uh, yeah, no, no brainer. So like maybe there's a bit more points, but I'm still not taking him to score more than anybody on the like the top points were on the Knicks like certainly not Jalen Brunson um I still think you cap um Halliburton at like if he makes four threes all right cool maybe he's getting 20 22 points but I still don't think that's going to touch Jalen Brunson taking 29 shots plus 14 free throw attempts etc so yeah the, the the leading scorer stuff is safe the leading rebounder stuff I think it's pretty safe as well for 6-4 Josh Hart so that is all the time we have for you in uh, best. No, what are we doing here? We got player props in this one. Uh, best bets is in a separate video. We have that alongside these player props each and every day now moving forward throughout the playoffs. So subscribe to that page. Continue to follow along. And until we see you next, happy betting. Stop.